Well, everybody, the time has come to discuss the three-body problem. Everybody, and their mother, and their father, their grandfathers, has insisted to me that I must read this book, that it is one of the great all-time classics and masterpieces required reading, and I'm an idiot because I haven't read it. And I was curious to read it. I had a certain amount of skepticism because of the vociferousness of the endorsement and the ubiquitous popularity of it, but I put my skepticism to one side, I gave it a chance, and I gotta say, I was surprised by how much I absolutely hated it. That might seem like a strong word, hate. We're not allowed to hate things anymore, or if we do hate things, oh shit. <laughs> Some instant karma for those of you who are already pissed off at me for this review. Before we get into the blood and guts, I just want to address this old saw around three-body problem that does actually get criticized a lot. I'm not the only one. I'm not a voice in the wilderness saying that this is not a great book. It does get criticized fairly often, and the response to the criticism is almost always, well, you just have to read the other 8,000 pages of the series, and then you'll get it. I dislike three-body problem to the point where I have zero interest in reading the other two books. Here's my beef, my big gripe. I have many big gripes. We'll start with this one. The writing sucks. I know that it is a translation. It's translated by Ken Liu from Mandarin. I know that the distance, the potential distance in meaning and also literary form and literary norms is greater from English to Mandarin and Chinese culture than it is from English to let's say French or Spanish or Polish or German. I get that there is a broader gulf, more potential to have things lost in translation. And also I'm coming into a literary tradition that is distinct. However, Lou was heavily influenced by Western authors like Arthur C. Clarke. So I feel that it is still fair to say that the writing is pretty poor. It's not just that it's boring and flat. It's also that Lou's attempts at lyricism and stepping up a notch in like a, trying to have some kind of literary flourish in his writing just feels so completely incompetent to me. It was like reading an eighth grader's poetry, these horrible tortured similes about a character's heart feeling like it's sprouting wings and stuff. I don't think that that's literally a line, but it's at that level. I'm also not the first person to notice that the characters are really dull and uh, poorly fleshed out. They're just, they're not barely even like the skeletons of characters. They're like spirit Halloween store plastic Halloween spooky skeletons. The plot moves glacially and the plot is constructed in such a way that things that are set up don't really like pay off things with super high seeming stakes at the beginning go nowhere. It's this slow trundle through the banal lives of the principal characters as they are very gradually introduced to the threat of a potential alien invasion from some of the most boring ass aliens I've ever read. The response to all of this, I know, is probably gonna be, well, Matt, yeah, that's all, well and good, and all those things are true, but um, there's something that you need to know about science fiction, which is that it's, it's a genre about big ideas, Matt. And uh, it's not about the writing as much as it's about imagination. Allegedly, three-body problem is supposed to have these paradigm-shattering big revelations and thought experiments and stuff. And I was hoping that that was in store, and it sure wasn't. And this notion of we should just give these books passes on having less than zero literary chops because they're science fiction. This like get out of criticism free card that gets waved around, I just don't buy it. I just don't believe that, that science fiction is fundamentally of lower literary quality than other genres or that we should have diminished expectations on that front when we read it. If that stuff didn't matter, if gratifying plot construction, beautiful and compelling language, good pacing, if these things really didn't matter, if we really only care about info dumping and scientific exposition and working through of science problems and speculation, 
Wouldn't we read JSTOR instead? Wouldn't we just read peer-reviewed journals? Isn't there something about novels and fiction that speaks to us on a level outside of like doing homework? I think that's why it does feel like a hangnail, why it, it makes me irked. Because I do care about science fiction a lot and I, I know from experience what it can do and how it feels when it really works at a high level. If you want a comparison, something like Solaris by Lem, which this book gets compared to periodically, if you want an example of literary science fiction delivering big ideas and technically hard SF ideas in a way that is transcendently incredible and beautiful and moving, there just is no comparison. Solaris is like drinking the finest, best, most artisanally roasted and prepared cup of coffee of your life. And Three Body Problem is uh, like someone microwaved a mug of tap water and uh, threw some unground coffee beans in it and handed it to you. It's like, oh, isn't this, it's, it's coffee in hot water. Isn't this the same? The thing that I can say on its behalf is that there were a couple of ideas that were novel. They weren't amazing. You would think that a book that was this hyper popular would be more readable, but it's, it's so dull to read. Like it's so, even for me having read as much hard SF as I have, it was almost impossible to concentrate on. My mind would wander hither and yon just constantly. I think there are a lot of books that are better ambassadors for science fiction than Three Body Problem. In a perfect world, I think a different book would would be like the title holder for the greatest science fiction book in, in recent times. This one I think is a good example of the kind of science fiction that I do really value and that I do really like. Electric Forest by Tanith Lee is a relatively unknown work of science fiction from an author who mostly wrote fantasy um, and was most active in the 80s and is celebrated as being a great prose stylist and an undersung genre author who deserves more popularity than she ever really got. And I have to say, having only read this one, that I agree. It takes place on a planet called Indigo that's on the outer fringes of this human uh, empire that spans many dozens of different planets. And on Indigo, human beings are selectively bred to control for disease and deformity and everybody is physically beautiful with the exception of a tiny handful of people who are not. And the protagonist, who is named Magdala, has the nickname Ugly because she was born with physical infirmities and is a social pariah. And she works in this menial job and lives in a menial apartment makes enough money to buy herself some small creature comforts and also to treat herself once a month to a meal of real actual food in the cafeteria attached to her uh, domicile. And during one of these meals, she's approached by this mysterious man who has some kind of interest in her she doesn't understand and he progressively encroaches upon her privacy until he violates it completely and presents her with the possibility of being made physically beautiful in exchange for uh, an unknown price that she has to pay. She accepts the offer and winds up having her life totally appropriated and she gets embroiled in this deadly mystery. And I can't say anything about it. I can't say anything about the ugliness cure that she uh, undergoes without spoiling something at around the one-fourth mark. One of the reasons why it is so excellent is because the prose is so good. Tanith Lee writes gorgeously. The plot is also satisfying on the surface, it almost reads like how I imagine a John Grisham book would read. It also reads a lot like Philip K. Dick, and it plays around with similar themes. I will say something potentially provocative here and say that, at least in Electric Forest, I think Tanith Lee is a better prose writer than Dick in any of the Dicks that I have read. She manages to be both an ideas person and also a prose person. It is indeed possible. I also thought that the characters were great and each of them is their own little mystery. And it's thematically subtle and sophisticated. But it illustrates significant points about um, abuse and power dynamics in relationships and also about beauty standards. I know that at least like 30% of you are rolling your eyes. Yes, these are topics that get covered a lot and that have gotten treatments in literature. Doesn't mean that they're not interesting. How many books have you read about the redemptive power of love? Eight billion? 
doesn't mean that you can't still write good fiction about that theme. Same goes here. It's only 150 pages long. It was published in the late 70s, and there was a golden period of about 20 years, I think, where books like this were produced that were concise, but punched way, like, eight degrees, eight levels out of their weight class. I would consider her in the same class as PKD, as Silverberg, as Bob Shaw. The writing also flirts enough with abstraction that it feels just a touch avant-garde, which I think really helps it a lot. Out of all those names, she reminds me the most of Philip K. Dick, but um, in terms of the prose, she actually reminds me much more of Anna Kavan, which is insanely high praise. So if you like the sort of mind-bendy, what is reality, uh, quick, snappy, high action books like Dick wrote, um, I would say give this one a shot. It is definitely a different flavor, but I think it hits the same notes. Be right with you. There are these amazing hummingbirds with these bright red beaks that you can't see, you idiot. If you're enjoying this video, I shoot long form videos about every single book that I read that I upload to Patreon. It's only five bucks, it gets you everything. There's probably four or five hours worth of content on there. This is gonna be an even more fun one to talk about potentially than a three body problem, even though probably nobody has read it really because it's a book that deals very frankly and casually with issues around uh, race and sexual identity. And it does so in a way that both does make sense contextually for the early 70s, and also is slightly abrasive. Is it thinkable that both things could be true? He's gone woke. He's gone, he's gone woke. He's doing cancel culture. I'll begin, I guess, by saying that I do like it. I think it's a very good book. It's a highly sophisticated narrative with one of the best endings of any genre book that I've read. And what genre is it? Depending on how you read it, it is either mainstream fiction and satire, or it is pick your genre, spin the wheel, is it science fiction, fantasy, horror, all the above. It's narrated from four different point of view perspectives from the four principal characters. All of them are male college students between the ages of 20 and 22 who are going on this cross country road trip because one of them uncovered an ancient Catalan document that describes a spiritual ritual that grants people immortality under the stipulation that four people have to apply and two of them do not survive the initiation process. They all pile into a car, they drink and screw their way across the country until they get to the deserts of Arizona where they encounter an ancient mysterious religious order who may be immortal. Like Dying Inside, which was written around the same time, I think right before or right after Book of Skulls, Book of Skulls is written very much like Philip Roth. And Book of Skulls is both sexually frank and I guess ethnographically frank in a very 1971 way. The four characters fulfill certain archetypes. There's the wasp, there is uh, the Jewish kid, there is a gay kid, and there's a brooding jock from the Midwest. And they seem to live in this like immediately tangibly felt ferment of grappling contradictory identities where they're constantly testing and prodding one another over issues of identity, calling each other racial and sexual epithets not in like a fratty way, but in, in a pointed way. It gets into some really dark territory. It, I think, has a hard edge along these lines, not just because it is of its time, but because it was meant to be a full contact book. I feel like I burned a lot of energy in my brain reading this one, both because it has this mechanic built into it of being ambiguous in light of the ending. Everything can be read in two different ways. There is also a similar thing going on where, at least for me, it was difficult to tell how much of that 
hard edge, how much of that sharpness and that transgression was Silverberg bringing his own perspective, which I know from experience can be kind of swaggering and macho, or is he portraying the state of mind of men in their very early 20s, fresh out of adolescence, who are engaging with the world in this crass and brawling way? I think Silverberg can be given enough credit that the latter is usually the case, but there are a couple of instances where I think Silverberg does show his hand just a little bit, and it is uncomfortable. The prose is amazing. Silverberg is and was one of the smartest people in the genre. It's definitely worth reading, even if you end up um, finding it distasteful. And you do feel, as you always feel when you read Silverberg, that you are in good hands. Thank you for watching. Peace.